Okay, um, so now we're going to continue part two of chapter 16. So the first thing that we have to know is the principles of this optical neutrality. It's nothing but you're using optics, okay, light to measure. So the measurement and manufacturer component is a is an essential part of production quality control. It is a trying to tell you that we use it, okay, this type of measurement in quality. Then optical measurement instruments, they require a reference surface of known okay, form and with which to compare the surface being measured. And we already know this, and just two formula in writing. Okay, it's all that we have to know is that you need a reference surface. And you need that reference surface from a known object. And what are we doing with this information? We are going to measure, okay, something that we don't know, yeah, using something that we already know. So optical methods give great advantage in metrology because the magnification, okay, we can get it um, by using telescope. We can also do reversal technique. And we get the ability to use a gravity, right, as our reference. And we don't really have a lot of difference between a microscope and a telescope. So in optical metrology, we check the alignment by using reversal technique. So that's just doubling the errors that can be eliminated. Um, we use a gravity here in this method because gravity provides the basic reference. And in optical metrology, vertical, okay, when we say vertical, it means in the direction of the gravity. And horizontal or azimuth means perpendicular to the gravity. Because as you know, gravity, okay, it's like going this direction, that way, okay? So that's the reference that we're using. And vertical, right? Vertical is the direction of your gravity. And then your horizontal or azimuthal is going to be perpendicular to that direction, okay? Okay, geometry. So this method has more advantages than contact measurement and the results when you look at it, okay, for the optical alignment, they're useful and ambiguous and we can also repeat it, okay? Why? Because they follow the basic principles of metrology. So when you look at the alignment, a straight line, okay, is the shortest distance between two points. And that's just a mathematic expression of a straight line that you have the two points, okay? And we call it the shortest distance between the two points is a straight line. And any other point, okay? So any two point, it doesn't matter which one you pick it up, okay? You can do this too. And if you get the shortest distance, then you're gonna get a line. Okay, here drawing is not straight, it has to be straight. You can pick up another two line, and then you have a shortest distance, and that's going to be your line. So there can only be one line, okay, established by any two points. And there is no limit, okay, to its length, even if we say, like, uh, by definition, a straight line, okay, is the shortest distance. Um, there really is no limit to that land established by two points. Now we're going to have a third point. So when you have that third point, you have three points, okay? So if they're on the same line, we call it collinear. So if any point is not on the line created by two other points, you can describe the relationship among the points in three ways, okay? So here, this one is not on the same line 
the point B is out of A and C line, okay? And here the point A is out of B and C line. And the distance is N. Here in this case, the distance is M. Here in this case, you see is out of AB line. Okay, the distance is L right here. Now C is on the AB line. At that time, we call that three points on the same line. We call these points collinear. Okay, now we have three points. And here we also have lines, okay? And they have uh, several angles right there. So you must be able to recognize which line is the desired reference, okay? Whether you're gonna use the horizontal one or the angle ones. So that also depends on what you're measuring. We also have to know which ones are the errors, okay? Errors are those that are not on the alignment of or that are not along your reference line. Because you always have to compare it, okay, your measurement with the reference line. So any two of the three bearings here, okay, establish a desired axis. So the axis can cross any two of that. And the displacement of third bearing is going to cause the error, yeah? So you have to know, one, the line. So that comes with two of the three points is going to be your line. And the error is going to be because of the displacement of the third, okay, point. Or well, here in this case, the third bearing, yeah? So when you think about it, you're going to first choose two lines. Uh, one line with two points, so choose two points right there, okay? And that is going to be your desired axis. And if you have a third, okay, point, the third point can be right here, okay, it can be right there. It can also be on it, yeah? But then this displacement, okay, wherever that third point is going to be, and that displacement is your error, okay? So I'm going to write an E right there. So for this point, this little displacement is your error. Okay? And here is your first initial two points. The connected line okay, is your axis. So this is your axis. Okay? So if you go back to this picture, you can see one, two, three. Yeah? So if I choose this two B and C, and that's going to be my axis, yeah? So therefore the point right here, the A, okay, the displacement, okay, of A from that line is going to be your bearing, your error, okay? Then the second one here, you're going to see this and that point. So that's going to be your axis. So in that case, okay, your C is off of that line. And the amount, okay, of that distance amount from the axis is your error. And if you're going to connect your A and then C, okay, we're going to do the same thing. So this and that. So make sure you track this little plus, okay, that's your point. So when you connect that, the displacement or B, okay, is going to be your error. Okay, so now we're coming into three points. So if you have three points, we're going to have three straight lines because you're using two points for one line, okay? So here, if I have A, B, and C, three points, I have the first line, A, B, the second line, your A, C, and the third line is your B, C, okay? And also, if you have three points with three lines, you have a triangle. So that's what it's saying. In addition, they establish a triangle with three inside, okay, and nine outside angles. So three inside is one, and then two, and then three. Okay, nine outside is because you have one, two, three, okay, uh, four angles right there, okay? And here the same thing, five, six, and then seven, eight, okay? So this example is not a good one. Uh, all you have to say is each point has three angles, okay? So therefore, you have three outside angles for each point, a total of nine. And then 
and three inside angle. Okay, because each point you have one inside and three outside angles. So therefore you have three inside, okay, and nine outside angles. So if you take a look at it, we can draw like that. So you have one, two, and then three points, and then you're gonna have a three lines, okay, across those points. There is not very good. Anyway, you see the points. So then you have an inside angle. You have one, two, and then three. Okay, I'm going to change the color right there for you. And then the outside angle is one here, and then two right there, and then three right here, and then four right here, and five, and then this is six, and then that's seven. Okay, and this is eight, and then nine. Okay, so every time you have one point, two point, three point, you have three lines. Okay, the first line, the second line, and then the third line inside angle you have one two and then three inside angles right in there and then you have outside angles nine of them in total okay now let's get back to this picture so it's just showing you the angular displacement and uh, the angular displacement you can see right here uh with gradients okay so angle we have gaf when we trace it that's your g and that's your a and that's your F. So we're talking about this angle Q right there. And we have our line CB. And we have ED. And then we have, uh, okay, this supposed to be GF. Okay, GF. And they are your gradients. So if you know the distances between the points, you can establish the angles by trigonometry. So trigonometry is a review from your middle school and high school. So play with the triangles, okay? So even more useful in optical alignment, their gradients are completely proportional. And it's proportional according to this angle right there, okay? So it's going proportionally. So we have first triangle right there, second triangle with the second gradient, and here the third triangle right there, okay? And they're all proportional to each other, and they're a common connection it's the same angle at A, yeah? Okay, so a plane. So a plane is defined by three points, okay? And these points, they're not collinear. And we already know what collinear is. So if you have a two points, and then if you connect that two point, you got a line, okay? Collinear means the third point is not on that line, okay? Um, not collinear, I mean the third point is definitely not on this line. Collinear means the third point is on the same line, okay? So here we wanted they're not collinear. So when you take a look at it, you're going to see AB, the first, okay, two points, and we have a line across that two points, and we have a third point right there, okay, and they are not collinear. And we have another one, and we have another one. So if you imagine A, B in the space, okay, you have, um, you can be able to, you know, position the third point anywhere, okay, 360 degree around. So you will have infinite, okay, number of planes um, by just adding, okay, the third point in any position around that line. But then we can only establish a single plane by using one line and a third point, okay? But we can have infinite number of planes around this line. Okay, now we'll get into parallelism. Parallelism depends on the choice of planes, okay? Which planes are you using? So two straight lines, they may be parallel, okay? So if you have two straight lines, they may be parallel in one plane, okay? If you put that on one single plane, they may be parallel, but they may not be parallel if they're on another plane, okay? So that also depends on the position. So when you take a look at this example right here, okay, where's all of the horizontal edges of the part A, so this one, the horizontal edges are right here, okay, may appear to be parallel. So when you look at this, okay, and when you look at that, and when you look at this, 
and then when you look at these edges and right here they look like they are parallel to each other but when we do the closer inspection okay it, it may reveal that their parallelism okay depends on the choice of the plane so if i take the site view yeah and you're going to see the surfaces they are parallel yeah and when you take a look at the top view like looking this thing okay from the top direction and then looking it downward from here so you see the not okay non-parallel surface you can be able to see it because there is an edge right here yeah so when you look at from the top they may not be parallel then when you look at it here you will see the two plane okay one is we look at it from the side okay and the other one is we look at it from the top okay so the plane right here so you have to look your eye got to be right here okay to look at it look at this plane from the top yeah so for this plane you your eye got to be on this side okay so you're looking at this plane from the side so at that time you can see there's two lines right there are parallel but if you take a look at it from the top they may not be parallel so it depends on the position of the plane okay it also depends on the choice of your plane okay number six so light is reflected and it can be reflected Okay, from a mirror so at an angle so it's going to hit the mirror and then it's going to go reflect out so when they reflect out okay from the surface of the mirror you're going to get the angle so what we know is light is reflected from a mirror at an angle okay and we know the angle is twice the angle at which the mirror is set Okay, to the light source. So when they reflect, they go with 2p right there. Yeah. So here the mirror is set right here at p angle. But when they reflect, they go with 2p. So incident light ray. So in this example, our light ray is right here. Okay, this one L. So coming in, I'm going to hit this mirror. Okay. So your mirror right here is your AA, is this is your mirror right there, okay? So your light ray L is going to be on the mirror L, mirror AA, and it's going to reflect it, okay? As the ray M right there, yeah? But now this mirror position, okay, it doesn't have the uh, uh, totally straight, okay? It doesn't have a angle yet, but we're going to tilt it. Yeah, so if the mirror is rotated then by an angle, so we rotated P right here to the position. Okay, so now our mirror position is B. It's kind of like you're holding a mirror on your hand and then, uh, okay, directing the mirror towards the sun ray, same as that. Yeah, and then you tilt it around. Anyway, so the reflected ray is now going to be N. Okay, and at that time, we're going to be seeing double the angle P. You know, here, you're going to just P. Right here, you have double the amount of that angle. Okay. So right now in A, P is zero. Yeah. So therefore, it's going to just go back out. Okay, with the same positional angle. So, oh, that's a 180 degree. Okay, just going back out. But when you tilt it, the reflected ray is going to take two times of this angle, okay? Okay, now we're going to use our telescope. That's your optic measurement, optical measurement instrument. And we're going to measure straightness, okay? So the telescope alignment is like your rifle scope. So we all have a rifle, and then you will use a rifle scope, okay, uh, going with 100 yards, or 500 yards, or 25 yards, or 50 yards, so and so, okay. And we call that a sight. 
axis is the same thing. Okay, so telescope alignment is the same as your riphoscope alignment. So therefore, we use the same term, sight. You know, so if you see the word sight in optical measurement, we're talking about the telescope alignment. So the objects are, you know, they're similar for both instruments. So riphoscopes, they have um, erecting systems, okay? And we also have erecting system in telescope. So when you talk about telescope, don't think about a big, you know, telescope in the lab um, to look at the uh, planets or stars outside. We have a small telescope that we use for surveying, you okay, know, survey um, here um, in the engineering okay, uh, industries. So don't think it's so, so big right now, okay? If you talk about telescope, you're thinking about stars only. No, get it back to the world, the real world, uh, practical, okay? Practical measurements uh, that you can use. Like surveying in your land, we're gonna use a telescope with light, yeah? So in optical metrology, the object or point of aim is usually a scale, or it is, we call it a target, okay? So that's where you're aiming your telescope to measure. So now you learn two things. The very first one is your sight is your telescope alignment, okay? We can erect our system, yeah? So they're not fixed. You can erect in any angle you want. And it's pretty similar to the rifle scope. And you have the object of aim, and we call that the target. Okay, when you do your shooting with your rifle, the same thing, the object of aim, your target is called a target. Okay, your alignment is called the sight. So same as that. So if you take a look at this uh, picture. So when you take a look at this picture, uh, you're gonna see the optics okay, of this alignment telescope. We're gonna place a crosshair, okay? Um, radical in the plane of that image. So this line right here, and that's your eye, and that's your eyepiece to look into it. And uh, when you take a look at right there, okay, and we call this the plane of crosshairs, okay? And that is the center of your crosshair. So in optical metrology, the object, okay, is right here. That's your point of aim. Is usually a scale or a target. And here, this is your line of sight. Okay? And that's your optic. So your optical center right there, that's your uh, lens of your uh, objective lens. And this one is you can move it okay, back and forth because we're doing the focusing right there with this line. Concave and then convex. And here is your inverted image. Okay, So we know this is inverted because you can see the arrow. Okay, I'm going to draw that for you right here. So review your physics. Okay, physics, optics, uh, right here. This. Okay, so that's your inverted image. Okay, and this is our object. Okay, and we are seeing this right here in the inverted okay, image. And then with through the eyepiece, we're going to see the same thing of that. And here, the crosshair, plane of crosshair, the center of crosshair, it's going to be right here at this image that you can see, okay? So anyway, if you get the sight, which is your line of sight, okay, and if you get the object of aim, which is right here, okay, and if you're aware of the plane, of your crosshair okay, so right at the inverted image that you can see and you know that we're using okay the optics right there and two of them and you're okay okay now we're going to get into how to read it so line of sight in abbreviation we call that los so that's line of sight okay telescope so line of sight telescopes, and we call them line of sight scopes. They are the simplest form of telescope, and they are most useful for establishing lines of reference. 
So when telescopes are used as measuring devices or measurement instruments, optical micrometer is added to them because we have to measure. Yeah? So micrometer is going to give you some sort of scale right there so that you can be able to read the distance out of it. So the optical micrometer displaces the line of sight okay, parallel to itself by means of an optical flat in an optical path. Again, you don't have to know all of the detail. What you have to know is we're using the micrometer so that we can make the measurement out of it and be able to read okay, the measurement by using the line of, scope, uh, line of sight scope, which is the simplest telescope. And then we're using the displacement to be able to connect to that measurement with your instrument ability, okay? So the, in, the displacement is read on the micrometer drum, yeah, right here. So the micrometer is gonna move the flat, which is your optical flat, through the small angles. And that's how we're getting our discrimination and division. And the eyepiece is the one that you look into, can be added to read the micrometer. Again, the principle right here for reading the optical micrometer is going to displace your cross line, okay, uh, but does not change the angle of your line of sight. So the displacement, you can read it, okay, on the micrometer and drawn. So when you take a look at it here, and so that's just uh, showing you a real big exaggerated picture right there, and here is your objective lens, okay. And this is your micrometer drum, where you're going to read the scale, okay? Again, the scales can be proportional, so you can uh, get it into, okay, so here is it going with a 2.5 scale reading, and that's the trouble of your micrometer, okay, rotation right there. And you're going to add that up together, and uh, that's your correct reading, okay, of your scale. So that's your tooling scale. So the scale reading, and you will always have a, what kind of scale that is, is going with 2.5 and 2.6, okay? Now this one is your crosshair, okay? At next whole number, it's going to be 2.5. So that's where your measurement is going to stop. So it's stopping right here, okay? So right here for this position is between 2.5 and 2.6. And here we're going to stop at 2.5. So what are we doing? So the plate, the micrometer plate, is not at an angle right here, yeah? Because of this optical flat that the micrometer moves, okay, through a smaller angle. Here it's just so exaggerated. This is a very tiny little angle right there that is going to give you the difference in scale of, okay, going between 2.5 to 2.6 is now getting to 2.5. And what you need to know is the scale is depending on the angle, okay, of your micrometer. So if you know that, okay, the visual, we're going to read it from the micrometer drum, okay? So here we have zero setting, okay? At that time, we have this too. Now we're going to rotate the drum down. And then we're going to read the micrometer at 0 0.068. At that time, your crosshair is at 2.5. Okay, on this uh, tooling scale. So you have two scale right here. Okay, so now we get into alignment telescope. So there's another type. So it's made by adding optical micrometer. So we're going to add micrometer to the alignment telescope to make a sense out of the measurement. Okay, so you can read it to the line of sight. The so most alignment telescope, they have two micrometers. One is for your x-axis, and the other one is for your y-axis. And magnification is going to vary automatically, okay, from four times at zero focus, and you can go all the way to 46 times, okay, at infinity focus. So when you look at the alignment telescope, it's really similar to the line of sight telescope that uh, includes at least one optical micrometer. Okay, so now we have two of them. So one on X and the other one is on Y. 
and some of them they have optical micrometers in two axes. So here one and then one came to write them. Okay, so to establish the most accurate line of sight, okay, um, possible in respect to the workpiece, we add two spheres. Okay, that's the reason why we're using two in this telescope. So the line of sight passes through the center of each sphere. So we have the first one and the second one, and here this is your straight line. Okay, you can imagine there are two points, and if you connect the two points, you're going to get a shortest distance possible for that line. Yeah. So and you can be able to change that. Okay, uh, length of this line in anywhere you want. So any distance you want to. So it's pretty convenient. So you have two spheres, and we have a line of sight passes through the center of each sphere. So geometrically, a sphere you can turn. Okay, without changing the center position because the diameter or the radius is the same. It doesn't change. Okay. So if you got the center of a sphere, you can rotate the sphere. Okay. But the radius doesn't change. So therefore. The distance from here all the way to here can never be disturbed, even though you're turning around the two spheres. Okay, so how genius, how genius the design is. So anyway, so you can rotate the sphere, and your line of sight is not going to be disturbed, meaning it's not going to change. And the most important thing to do this design is we want to keep that center position intact. So one sphere is going to align with the telescope, okay, and the other sphere is going to align with your target. Okay, so here I have my target, and I have a first sphere right there, and I have my telescope, I have my second sphere right there. And that two okay, is going to be connected with our line of sight, right? That's your target, first sphere, telescope, second sphere, and you have two points right there. Every time you have two points, you've got a straight line, okay? And that line can never be changed that distance as long as you position that way, okay? Even if you're rotating here and rotating here. Okay, mounting. So the mounting provides a constant datum. We need a datum point, so from which the measurement, okay, is taken. So the socket for the spear okay, is known as the mounting cup. So that's your mounting cup right there, flange cup or cup mount, whatever you want to say. You can just say mounting is fine too, doesn't really matter. And the telescope, we're going to mount it okay, on that base. So when you take a look at this, so with the spear okay, mounted in a bearing, the line of sight, Okay, so even though we're rotating this sphere right there, the center is going to be the same because the radius is the same. So the line of sight always passes through the center, even if you change the angle. Okay, or how do you change the angle? You're just holding the telescope, okay, and you can move your hand. So that's how we change the angle. But then the center is always kept constant right there. So that provides a constant height data okay, for the measurement. So the constant height is right here okay, from your mounting to the center. That doesn't change. Why? Because our design is a sphere. Okay? Your line of sight can change angle right there. So how are you changing this line of sight? Because you've got your telescope, okay, which is this thing. And you can, you can hold it with your hand. Okay? And you will be holding it like this, okay? Or you'll be holding it up like that, yeah? So every time you do it, you have a change, okay, of the angle, line of sight changes. But the distance, okay, which is the most important thing, so the line of sight got to pass through the center, and it will always be passing through the center. And then it's going to give you the constant, okay, uh, datum height, which is right here, yeah? The radius is the same. This is just showing you the rear version of your alignment uh, telescope. Yeah, it looks pretty nice. And this is your mounting. Okay, your mount is connected to the spear right there, first spear. 
and uh, when we are dissected and looking at from the cross section, you're going to see this. Okay. So we have our telescope, and then we have our target. They are mounted. Okay. When you mount, when you mount them, and then when you align, okay, then we're going to get a line of sight right here, and it's called the straight edge. Okay. You have your telescope. You have your target. We're going to align them, we're going to mount them, and we're going to establish a line of sight. Now we're going to give it a name, and we call that straight edge, okay? Another term, and which is used for horizontal reference. That is horizontal reference. So alignment telescope, okay? We use it in aircraft, missile, you know, nuclear metrology, you know, big things. So the straight edge is weightless. There's no weight in it, just a line. Okay. Uh, it just this we call this a line of sight between your telescope and then your target. And that's just the equivalent of your straight edge right there. And it has no okay, practical length limits at all because you can move the target uh, anywhere. You can extend the target right here, or it can be right there, or it can be somewhere over there. Okay, now we will get into limitations. So every instrument, they have their own limitations. Okay, none of the instruments are perfect. We're not perfect. So we have our own limitation, what we can do or we cannot. So the field of view is the largest diameter that can be viewed through the telescope. Um, so as the distance from the telescope increases, the field of view increases, okay? So i just trying to tell you, now you have your telescope, okay? And the field of view is nothing but it's just a diameter, okay? A diameter that can be viewed through the telescope. So uh, you will see like this, okay? So here is your telescope and you're looking, okay? in the eyepiece and you're going to see a view and that view is nothing but a diameter like that okay mm -hmm. and the field of view is the largest diameter okay largest diameter that you can see through the, the telescope so as the distance from the telescope increases the field of view increases okay why because um you want to see it yeah so if the distance here is your target and here is your telescope, so if this distance increases, your field of view is going to be increasing. Okay, the next thing you have to know is your depth of focus. So that's just nothing but the maximum distance, okay? So the distance between two objects in the focus. So focus is done by adjusting the movable lens. We already show you the lens and you can move that okay, back and forth. So that's how you're focusing. So if you have one object here and one object there, okay, uh, you have a distance okay, between the two objects. So the depth of focus is we're trying to get the maximum all right, distance between the two objects in focus. And that focus is done by, again, adjusting the movable lens inside of your telescope and the distance range of your telescope is marked again on the drum yeah the measurement drum measurement reading drum so the reliability depends on on the precision again of your focusing so, so the measurement that you're getting from the telescope depends on how well you can focus the object of aim or your targets. Okay, so when you use um, optical alignment okay, instruments like this telescope, you definitely need to know data. Okay, so data must be consistently understood when we use this type of instruments. So how do we do it? Take notes for each step. Okay, so you won't forget. Then we're going to identify the relationship. So which relationship are you identifying? You're going to identify the relationship of your telescope, okay, to the workpiece, work okay, at the beginning. 
Number three, we're going to use a uniform convention okay, for recording data so everybody can be able to understand what you're writing. So such as the popular, and we call the LURD, is LURD okay, convention. And it's nothing but just an acronym. So your L is your left, your U is up, and then your R is go to the right, and then D is go down. Yeah? So left, up, right, and down. Okay, LURD is a convention we will be using to recall the data. Why do we have to do it? Because we want to re reduce and we want to prevent error. So make sure you get that, okay? And, uh, this is in one of the assignments. So you should be able to come up with the displacement, okay, to the left or right or down or up, and then the distances in either British system in inches or matrix system in millimeter or, or centimeter, okay? And then you have to give me all your alert. Okay, this is just showing you your targets. So your targets are uh, they are available in a variety of patterns like here. So we have V-type, K, okay, and we have long distance, we have re rectangular scale, and then we have cross Vs, and so and so. But sometimes only one target is needed, okay, and all the times two or more targets are needed. And that's just to ensure the precision of your measurement. So here we have our standard circular okay that's just a typical target patterns right here we have graduations and graduations are very helpful here right? you can see the graduation right there in the target and they're very helpful when the displacement is greater than the range of your micrometer okay we call this v type and it's circular and you have your displacement Okay, uh, graduations here. Uh, we have long distance. We've got rectangular scale right there because your scale, see? So these are your scale and it's in the form of a rectangle. And we have cross V, okay? This is your V and your Vs and your Vs. So that's what we call it, cross, and they're all crossed to each other, so cross Vs. Okay, so for a standard circular target, the reading is to the center of your annular ring. So that's your ring right there. So here in this case, the displacement, they write it right here. Okay, that's 0 0.6 inches from the center of the target. So what it's trying to tell you is just showing you a standard circular target, okay, from the previous slide. And I'm going to tell you how to read it. Okay, so the reading in the target of like this, the standard target, is going to the center, okay, of your annular ring. Um, this, you will have to look at it in your handout and you will see a bigger, okay, um, figure. Here is a, just a kind of small to see, but you can still see, okay, the target right there, and then this is your cross pin. This is dead center right now. Now it's like moving to the right, it's moving to the right here, closer to back to the cross center, and then it's uh, going okay uh, to the left. Oh, sorry, to the right and and up. Okay, it might be on the actually to the, the horizontal cross line right there. So anyway, it's definitely on the right. So that's just a general reading technique. Okay, I'm showing uh, right here for you. So here you can see the, how the measurements are uh, taken using the target pattern. And then you have your micrometer, yeah? You have two micrometer. One is all for the x-axis and the other one is for y-axis. So even if you see three, okay, little box right there, so that's your first micrometer and that's your second micrometer. 
because they have the scale on that one, it's just nothing, okay? And so here you can have your alignment telescope and this is in real life, okay? This is your telescope right there and this is your base and your mount right there, your first sphere right there. Okay, your micrometers are attached right there for you to your reading. Okay, and this is your eyepiece and that's your eye. Okay, and here from this point, da -da -da, go all the way down to the target is your line of sight. Okay. So we want a really straight line, so therefore we don't touch with our hand. So we use with our hand, our hand going moving up and up and on. So we definitely attach the telescope okay, to the mount and the mount is completely secure to a stabilized okay, uh, pole right here in this case. Okay, now we're going to draw the diagram of what we do. And the line is used okay, to reveal any displacement okay, from the line of sight. So when you look at it, we don't want this line of sight to be going up and down, up and down. Okay, we don't want to, that's what we're seeing. We don't want any kind of displacement from the line of sight. We want perfectly straight. Okay, in order for that to happen, we use support, we use clamp, we use everything to stabilize, okay, this um, line of sight, okay. And we don't touch with by, uh, by hands in order to, again, minimize the displacement, okay, from the line of sight. So this is just a typical application of your alignment telescope. So the line of sight has been established along the center of rotation of a lathe spindle. So you right here is your line of sight. Okay. And the intermediate target attached to the compound okay, allows the path of the compound travel to be compared with the axis of your target spindle. So here, this is your target intermediate and that's your collimator target. And here is your cylinder, okay? And that's another sphere right there. And that's your compound lathe right here. And that's another mount. This is your telescope stand, okay? And this is our alignment telescope. And we put it in a bracket so we can stabilize this line of sight. The intermediate target is nothing but, okay? Uh, we just are trying to uh, make the path, okay? Uh, correct the path so you can travel to be compared with the axis okay, to the target spindle. So here you can see that, yeah? So that's the line of sight right here and that's our intermediate target and that this is our target, okay? Okay, vertical displacement. So we don't want the displacement, we want the minimum displacement, okay, because vertical displacement, they're error. So vertical displacement can be directly read along the line of sight. So here, this is our long, okay, line of sight, LOS, okay. So that got to be in equal heights, okay. So errors are nothing but any kind of deviation or displacement. So if the displacement is happening vertically, we call it vertical displacement, okay, and you will have error, okay. That's the reason why we use the stand and the mount and the clamp and everything to stabilize the system, okay, measurement system right here. So what you're seeing is like, so in addition to the measurement of deviation, okay, from the straightness by means of one or more intermediate targets, sometimes we put here, I have intermediate target right here. Okay, to make the LOS as straight as possible. So sometimes we use a datum target, okay, uh, directly to measure the vertical displacements. Again, we don't want the vertical displacement, so therefore we insert, okay, uh, intermediate targets right in there to make sure the LOS is straight. Okay, auto reflection. Okay. So alignment telescope, they measure distances from line of sight, and we already know that. So the angles cannot be measured directly with it. You can't do that, okay? Here, alignment is just, we'll make sure that your LOS is as straight as possible. We cannot be able to measure the angle directly with it, 
the internal illumination source, and we call that the telescope uh, lamp house. It's just illumination inside, okay, of the source, and is added to the measurement angles, and uh, that definitely gives us a great precision in the measurement. So we cannot do angle measurement without internal illumination source. We need it, okay? We need to see it. So, and we call that telescope lamp house, okay? And this internal illumination source is added, okay? Why do we do it? To measure the angle, okay? And we can measure the angle with great precision if we have this internal illumination source. Okay. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at where we're going to put this lamp house. So your lamp house is inside of your telescope, okay? And then we're going to put it uh, inside. So here you can see this is your lamp, then that's your condenser lens, and we're going to put it, okay, uh, right here. So this is your mirror right there, okay? I just said trying to uh, increase the illumination so you can be able to see the angle, you know, because they're very small. So the t this lamp house has a target on its cover glass, okay? This is your cover glass right there, okay? And that's your target, okay? And our auto reflection is used, automatically reflecting auto reflection, okay? It's used when angles are measured with this illumination. So what you truly need to know is in order for us to be able to measure angle by using telescope, okay, we're gonna need a lamp house, yeah? So what we're doing here is we use this internal illuminator, which is your lamp, to illuminate the cross lines, okay, of your reticle. And uh, these are then projected with this line of sight, yeah? So if you pay attention to your diagram, you have your lamp right there, your mirror there, okay? And that's gonna use the light coming out from that lamp through this condenser lens, okay? We have to condense so you get more light. So you can see, okay, uh, if you pay attention to the picture, um, you don't really have to memorize anything, okay? Here is your light, here is a condenser lens. If we want to know what is this thing doing, you just take a look at the picture, okay? So here your lights are going spreading around. What we're doing is we're condensing. So see how it's going, okay? This is diverging. So now we're converging, like trapping the rays, okay? Converge to this mirror, yeah? So when we have the lights, we're going to use it right here to our reticle. Reticle is not where your crossing lines are, okay? And then we're going to control the line of sight, okay? In order for us, so there's another mirror here. So that's just a cover glass target right there. And we have uh, another concave mirror right there, okay? So you can be able to get. So that's just uh, uh, behind the mirror, okay? It's just a plane. We don't have physically behind. It's just a uh, reflection of that, we're, we're trying to say, okay? Uh, these dotted lines, so you have to review your physics. Uh, nothing but if the ray passes a mirror to the other side, okay, we are gonna have your imaginary target right there somewhere there. But then now your target is actually right here, yeah, in the real world. Okay, now we will really get into auto reflection. So that's that is the image automatically again reflected towards the telescope, okay, back from the mirror. So when projected image of your cross line is interrupted with a mirror. So we're going to interrupt by using the mirror and here is your cover glass target and that's your line of sight okay your image is going that way hit the mirror and going to go back okay and that's you call it auto reflection and that auto reflection is going to be okay um reflected back to the uh telescope okay and you will get your projected image which is going to be around here okay and what we're using is we're using the mirror to interrupt that line of sight back to the telescope. So you have your cross line image returned, okay? And then this is your angle of deviation. So it deviated from your line of sight. 
See, so this little angle right there, I can draw draw it off for you right here. This little angle right there, yeah. So it's supposed to go this way. You can't get 180 degree back like that, okay? You will always get like coming on an angle. Even if we have this mirror like totally vertical, you still have an angle. So auto reflection, the projected image of your cross okay, line is reflected by the mirror back to the target okay, at your telescope. And that is a derivation of the term auto reflection. Okay, so here auto reflection targets. So we have uh, in uh, typical okay auto reflection targets. So this is your uh, 1653. So the gradients we can see the gradients at all the mirror to telescope distances, and they're all proportional. We already know the gradients are proportional. Okay, remember our triangle because of this the same angle at the end. Okay, so therefore the gradients are completely proportional to each other. So the connection is your angle. So if you remember this, you can be able to understand your gradient, okay? Right here, they're all proportional because of the same angle they're sharing, okay? Coming out from that. So anyways, the auto reflection is based on that principle. And you wanna see here in this, so the gradients at all the mirror to telescope distances, they're all proportional. So we're going one, two, three, five, and here we're going 100, okay, and then 200. So when you take a look at it here, you're going to get 10, 25, 50, and then go 150. This is a two targets. The first one is your British system or English, and the other one is your matrix, your SI system. So this side is another picture, okay, on the right, and this is just based on the micrometer drum setting, okay, at zero. So if you look at it here, okay, auto reflection targets, they are read directly and we're reading the gradients, okay, of the tilted mirror. So in conventional units, the readings represent thousands of an inch, okay, and uh, per foot, of course, thousands of an inch per foot when the mirror is one foot, okay, in front of the telescope. So for SI measurement, the readings represent millimeters. Okay, so here these are these are in millimeters. Okay, per meter when the mirror is one meter. Okay, from the telescope. Per meter meaning like we're telling the distance. Okay, of the mirror from the telescope. You always have a telescope right there. Okay, you always have a telescope right there, and then you have your mirror for auto reflection. Yeah. So it's going this way and reflect it back. So every time we reflect, you have an angle right here, okay? So the gradients are nothing but your deviation right there, see? So you can see that, okay? These are all your gradients. So I'm going to draw a little bit bigger so you can see this. So it's, it's kind of like your triangle right now is like this, okay? And you're sharing the same angle right here at your mirror right there, okay? And this is your telescope. So the line is going this way and then coming back this way, your reflection is, and we're getting the gradients right here. And the gradients are your deviations, yeah, from your LOS. And so uh, what we're doing is we're looking at okay, measuring that deviation with either English or matrix system. So if your mirror is like one foot, okay, away from the telescope, meaning from here all the way to here is one foot, Okay. then it's going to go with thousands of an inch per foot. Okay, So that's your readings are going to go with that way. So if your mirror is like in SI system, one meter, so one meter away, okay, one meter from the telescope to the mirror, you're going with millimeters per meter. Yeah, So the readings are going to represent millimeters per meter. So if you want to connect okay, these uh, lines right here in the circle with the gradients, so these are your gradients, yeah? So this line okay, at the center is the line of sight, that one, yeah? So you're seeing like this, okay? 
and you're seeing this deviation on it like that, okay, from your eyepiece, okay. Okay, here the same thing, the softball 0.25 and then 0.5, respectively, the inside-outside edges right there, okay, value of your central circle. So all other circle values are correct at the center of the appropriate line. Here the same thing on this side. We have examples here based on the book micrometer drums being set at zero. Okay. So here on this side, this is your telescopic to mirror distance. So that's a five feet. And then mirror gradient in thousand of an inch per foot. So this per foot is the mirror and your telescope distance. Okay. And uh, five feet is your uh, circle value. Then you're going to have your telescope to mirror distance in feet, which is that one. Okay. And when you calculate it, if we have 100, let's say, divided by 5, and that's a 5 feet, okay, telescope to mirror distance, and you're going to get 20, okay? So the mirror gradient is going to be 0 0.020 inch per foot. So if you don't understand, here is the telescope, and here is right here, it is your mirror right there, okay, and it's telling you it's uh, uh, 5 feet, okay? My feet. So the mirror gradient, so coming back, your auto reflection, and you have your gradient right there, okay? In thousand of an inch per foot. So instead of five feet, okay, we are, so for five feet, we are having 100, right? 100. So if we go with the first gradient, so right here, so yours is, that's 100. So if you go with 5 feet to 100, you're going to get 20, yeah? So since you are dividing 100 with 5, okay, that same as trying to find per foot, okay, distance. So if we go with the per foot, okay, you're getting this one, but that's in decimal, okay? So we're going to change that into decimal which is going to be your third decimal, your second decimal, so you will get 0 0.020, okay, inches per foot. Why? Because you have 5 feet for 100, so therefore one, one foot is going to be 20, and when you change it into decimal, because all of our measurements are going with the micro, so we will get 0 0.020. So we will not be asking you, okay, in details of calculation, you won't be getting it by now, you won't. So what you have to know and understand is know that uh, we're looking at the gradient, okay? We're using auto-reflection, using a mirror to reflect the rays back to the telescope, and that's where we get all of our edges, okay, in our micrometer drum setting, okay? And uh, this is all you have to know for now. Okay, so now we're going to use our micrometers. So when you use the micrometers, uh, you have to be careful with this following, okay, uh, checklist. So first, you have to have the readings. The second, if the cross line cuts the target circle, okay, there is your cross line right there, that's your target. So if they cut the target circle before rotation, you have to subtract the adjusted reading, okay? You have to subtract the adjusted reading after the cross line and the circle are tangent. Okay, so if the cross line is outside of the circle before rotation, you must add the adjusted reading. Again, we'll not be asking in details how to calculate it. It's a little bit uh, difficult for you, um, so you can just uh, read okay this, and if you know. What you should be careful, um, that should be okay for now. This is just trying to show you, okay, so when you look at it, you see your target there, and this is your cross line right here, okay. We can see our gradients right there from our auto-reflection, and we have a two micrometer. So now when you pay attention to that micrometer, you can see right there, okay, so both of your micrometer drums, 
Okay, they are set at zero. Okay, right here, little one right there, zero. And this is where we're telling you how to subtract, okay, the second one. You must subtract just a reading of the cross line. So what we're trying to do right here is your, your uh, cross line is cutting the target circle. And that's happening before the rotation, okay? So, um, so when you take a look at it here, you can see the drone, okay? is used to set to 50. So right here, you can see that's a 30, and then that's your 40, okay? So before rotation, it was set to 50, and the reading is right now 32. So on this drum, you're gonna see it's used to set to 100 circle, okay? Now the reading is a 30. And here it's just uh, trying to show you that subtraction. Okay, so you have your mirror is 10 feet away from your telescope. So we're going to divide and do the same thing. So the adjustment is right here, 100 minus 15 in this example. And then we're going to calculate the same thing. So you will get 8.5. So that is 8.5 is uh, okay going three decimal. So therefore, we're going to uh, count it from the back. So you get 0 0.0085. Yeah. And this is, we have two drums. So therefore, the first one is your x axis, your horizontal. The second one is your vertical, okay, which is your y axis from each micrometer. Again, we're not going to be asking you to calculate any of this. I just know that we have two micrometers. We have two reading. We will always start from zero setting. And then we're going to start rotating it, okay, in order for us to be able to adjust the target, okay? And uh, you can be able to calculate by adjusting the distance, okay? And then we will divide with the uh, telescope to mirror distance, the same thing as we did in the previous slide. And you will have to do two times because you have two micrometers. One is on the x-axis and the other one is on your y-axis. And this side is just showing you the same thing with the metric units. Okay, the next one is the autocollimation. So autocollimation is just a principle and is closely related to auto reflection. So this is just another technique, okay, uh, to use your telescope. So this features illuminated cross line, again, illuminated cross line focusing this time at infinity. So here we have pictures, okay, this one is showing you the laser autocollimator, okay or angle measurement of parts to, we can go all the way to one millimeter with this thing. And the other one right here is showing you the laser autocollimator, okay, used to monitor uh, monitor the angular movement. So they use it in a Newport gimbal mount okay, positioner, which is this one, yeah. So if you think about autocollimation, it's related to auto reflection, but this time we're gonna look we're going to be okay featuring the illuminated cross line okay your illuminated cross line this one okay and that focus is going to be okay at infinity yeah okay since we're focusing the infinity we have to do some sort of projection so our telescope came okay, with a cross line illumination. So we have illumination cross line. We can use that as a projector. So here you can see the telescope line of okay, sight is right there at the center. And we have our deviation right here. So that's just like a projected okay, cross line coming out from here from our telescope. And we can project it right here on a display. Yeah. Okay, let's attempt to measure the infinity. So infinity in optics is different from infinity in the meta mathematics. So they're all, okay, different infinity, uh, theoretically, of course. So in optical metrology, infinity, okay, is gonna designate the distance, okay, from which rays, okay, reaching the observer are parallel or collimated. So the alignment col collimator you can see it here in this picture. So it consists of an objective lens, okay? So we have objective lens right there, and, and it is positioned in front of a reticle. 
So the radical is nothing but your tilt target, which is this one, okay? Uh, so it, it is focused at infinity. By doing this little two thing, we can be able to focus at infinity. So it also has a second target, okay? So that's your alignment target. So that's right here, alignment target. And it is on the objective, okay, lens. So a standard illuminator, well, we can see it here, this is difficult to show. So that standard illuminator is going to illuminate this radical, okay? So that's how we can be able to focus the infinity. Okay, let's go to targets. So the alignment collimator, we have two targets. So the radical or tilt target is completely and permanently focused at infinity. And the other one is a target on the object lens, okay, objective lens, and the one at the end uh, in the previous picture, or is cover glass. So the alignment target, okay, uh, you can see it right here in this picture. So the tilt target is right here. It's just a radical of your alignment collimator, okay, it's scaled read in minutes again of tilt so these are in minutes and then the alignment target okay is a dispersion target so that's your alignment target and this pattern is telling you is a dispersion so it's on the cover glass of your collimator so when you uh, reflect what you have seen in the previous slide you're going to see like this okay and, and your alignment target is okay right here and uh, that's on the cover glass of your objective lens right here. Yeah? So here, what you have to understand is an alignment collimator. Uh, we read the scales in minute, okay? And that reading is dependent on your tilt. And we have two different targets. One is alignment, the other one is tilt, okay? And your infinity is focused, okay, at the reticle or tilt target. And that's pretty important. And that's all you have to know. Okay, so if the telescope and your collimator axis, okay, are at an angle to each other. So if you have some sort of angle between that two, the cross line of your telescope will be displaced from the center of your tilt target. Okay, you can see it right here in this picture. So I'm gonna go one by one. Uh, you can't be able to see it without looking at it carefully. Okay. So we have a first position and then we have aligned. We have moved but still in alignment. And we have the last one is aligned and center position. So if the telescope and collimator, your telescope is right here, then your collimator is right here. And we're paying attention to their axis. Okay. And if they're at an angle to each other, the cross line of your so right here is your cross line, okay, of your telescope is going to be displaced from the center, okay, of the tilt target. So your tilt target is right here, the center is right there. So this, okay, uh, alignment is going to be displaced. So when you look at the A, when the axis are parallel, they're parallel, okay, as in B, okay, right here also. So this is from the site view. The cross line and the center, they'll coincide. Okay, and the cross line and the center, they're gonna coincide because they are parallel to each other. Yeah. So when it comes to C, okay, it shows that it's not necessary for the axis to be on the same line of sight, only parallel. Okay. So when you look at it carefully, okay, they're still in alignment, but they have moved a little bit. So it's not necessary for the axis to be on the same line, okay, of sight only parallel. So when we come to D, okay, the axis are parallel in the telescope. When the axis are parallel, the telescope may then be focused on the alignment target. So here, line and center again. Okay, here, this is your center of displacement target. And this is your focus on the displacement target. So the parallel lines is going to get to you, okay? So when you look at the picture, you have to go slowly so that you can be able to pay attention. So you only have to pay attention. Here, I'm going to circle right here, your cross line right there, and then your center right here, okay? This one. 
So if you're displaced, they have they're moved. Okay. If they're not displaced, they are aligned. That's all we have to understand. Okay, about the alignment and also the angle. Again, if you have an angle, there is a displacement. If your angle is zero, they're completely aligned. Okay. Okay. Collimator, we're going to use it as target to bring the telescope line of sight into coincides with the optical axis of your collimator. So that's just a sole formula. All we're trying to say is you're going to align the telescope and the collimator on the same axis. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. Why? Because we can be able to focus all the way to infinity. So instrument calibration, alignment collimator okay, can be used in a variety of applications along with optical squares and all the optical instruments, okay? Basically, we're telling you we use the alignment collimator for calibration. And we use it along with other, okay, uh, instruments like optical squares. So here, when you look at this picture, so that's just uh, giving you the technique because this technique is going to save you uh, some time. So you have your telescope and then you have your collimator and they have their radical images okay projected onto a card right here in the center okay they're then adjusted in the usual manner so here is your card we're going to have a focus on the card this one is more perfectly aligned now we're going to remove the card okay this is not very straight you can't tilt it okay but then what we're trying to do is we're going to make the cross line coincide to each other. Okay, and then we're going to check the collimation if they're perfectly aligned. Why are we doing this perfect alignment? Because we want to focus to the infinity. Okay. Okay, so we use uh, collimator with optical square in calibration. So you need to know what, what is the optical square. So optical square is nothing but it's just used to align the right angle, okay? Square everything that is square looking like that, okay? Well, where is my pen? So everything looking with square got to do with angle, okay? And we're aligning the right angles. Okay, so optical squares are any optical instrument and that can turn the line, okay, of sight 90 degree from its original path. Okay, so this is 90 degree. So that's why we use optical square in order for us to be able to get the right angle. And here is a big picture right there. So that's just a typical situation in which an optical square is needed. Okay, what are we doing here? We're determining the relationship okay, of the vertical waves of this boring mill to the horizontal waves. We're trying to make a right. Here is your little optical square. Okay. Trying to make this angle 90 degree and we're measuring it. Okay, so if a mirror is set at 45 degree, a beam of light can be diverted 90 degree, but any errors in the mirror mounting or your parallelism of the base to the incident ray will be doubled in that reflected ray, so you have to be careful. So we already know, okay, reflection, when you tilt the mirror, it will give you the double the angle. So 45, okay, uh, times uh, 2 is going to give you 90 degree, okay, and 2 is going to give you 90 degree. And that is what we're trying to accomplish because with 90 degree is your right angle, yeah? So optical square is going to uh, do that for you. So if the mirror is set at 45, so when you look at it, here is your mirror, okay? And that's your mounting error right here. That's your base error right there. So your errors are always there as long as you use your instrument system of some kind. So here is your mounting error. Your base error is going to be right at that angle. And this is the desired 90 degree that we want to do, okay? So, so we're going to set the mirror at 45. Okay, try to reduce both of this error, systematic error right here, in order to get 90, perfect 90. Okay, we have to set the mirror at 45 because we're using a doubling angle principle 
of your ray, okay, incident ray reflection. So we're going to tilt the mirror, okay, to get double angle. Since we're doubling the angle, okay, to from 45 to 90, the errors that comes along with your system will also be doubled. So instead of this, we're going to use something called a pentagonal prism. So this is your call pentagonal prism, and we call that the pentaprism. Okay, pentaprism is going to correct that error. And we will use it instead of that setting. Okay, so the mountain error and then your base error, okay, they're not going to affect, okay, the 90 degree reflection. So we will have a perfect, perfect 90 degree, okay, reflection because this penta, pentagon right here, this geometry is going to compensate all these angles right there, okay? So that was a pretty impressive and genius idea how to get what we want to get in the way we want it, okay? So this is what we wanted. So these are our limitations. So you will always have mistakes and you don't have to be afraid of, okay, having mistakes. So as soon as you have mistake, you, you will always have how, you, because you will be thinking how to get rid of it, okay? If you're perfect, then you, if you don't have any mistake, you will not have any kinds of new method to get rid of all of your errors. So here you have errors, we're getting rid of that, and we have a, okay, innovation, new discovery here, and that's a pentaprism. So we use a pentaprism, okay, to get rid of these issues, your mounting error and the base error that comes with all your measurement system. So therefore, we can be able to get the optical square 90 degree, yeah? Okay, so if a pentaprism, we also call the pentagonal prism in a previous picture, okay, is used, a right angle deviation can no longer be disturbed, okay? We will have a perfect 90 degree and we won't be having any kind of deviation due to any of our system errors. So, and the prism can be moved again through five or six degrees of freedom. So that's a pretty big degree of freedom that you get, yeah? Now, when you take a look at it here, the pentaprism may be considered as two mirrors, and they are at, okay, 45 degree. So this is where we want to go, okay? So you have pentas on one side, two side, three side, four side, and then five here, okay? That's our common angle. So that's 45 right here. So each ray undergoes two reflections. So we're using two reflections for each ray. So in B, when you take a look at it right here in B, okay, so the prism has been rotated 5 degree. So that's a 90. And this prism is not showing here, but it's a definitely rotated 5 degree right there. So as a result, the first reflection is going to increase from 75, okay, and uh, A. So that's a 75 in A to 80 in B. So the second reflection is reduced by exactly the same amount. So therefore, 90 degree displacement here is going to be remains unchanged, although the prism has turned. So you can turn around the prism, but what's trying to tell you right now, okay, I don't like the picture so much because it's not showing you the uh, displacement of all of your angles, but what we're trying to say here is like uh, we're using, okay, um, displacement, okay, and the site, okay, since we have more than one site, now I have five of them right there. So when the ray comes in, okay, they're going to hit each of your sites, okay, and then they're going to reflect back, okay, out of there. And we want to make this angle double to 90, okay. So what we have, what you have to know right now is using the pentagon, meaning like we're increasing the site, of reflection okay so here you have five sides instead of uh, just one okay so right here you have our regular mirror it has only one side pentagon we have five sides so when you go inside of your pentagon so internal sides right there we're using two of that internal sides okay and two reflection right in there yeah so by doing that you can be able to keep okay this angle at 90 degree 
So the pixel is really, really small, okay? So when you look at this angle right there, that's your angle, little a. So that, okay, is rotated five degree. Okay, so five degree is uh, given you right here with this little dot right there. That's actually the, they're writing the degree right there, okay? So uh, that's your a here, and this is after the rotation of five degree. So what it's trying to tell you, using the two mirrors right there, okay, two of them right there, two of the sides of your five pentagons. So every time it hit the first reflection, it's going to increase the angle. The second, okay, reflection is going to reduce the angle. So therefore, they compensate to each other. Therefore, this double angle, because of this 45 tilt on the first mirror, will never be changed, okay? So what are we doing? We are uh, compensating with reflection. We have two reflections. The first one is going to increase the angle. The second one is going to decrease the angle. Whatever amount they're going to uh, increase, okay? So if they increase here 10 degree, the second reflection is going to reduce, okay? Uh, 10. So therefore, the increase plus 10 minus 10 will give you the same angle here. So if you move like 15 degree minus 15 degree here, second bounce, okay, you'll get the same angle. So that's what we're trying to, trying to do here in this settings. Okay, movement in only one degree of freedom affects the 90 degree angle. But in Pantar prism, okay, we have uh, six degree of freedoms. But if you have only one degree of freedom, it's going to affect your 90 degree, okay, angle because your movement is limited. Okay, so this picture is a little bit difficult for you to be able to see because then it's 3G. So the emerging beam from a pentaprism prism is only at 90 degree, okay, to the entering beam when both beams are in a plane perpendicular to the imaginary vertex of your prism. So what we're trying to say is this, okay, so here the first plane you can see right there, that's your plane of line of sight because the line of sight is on that plane, okay? Line of sight has two points, your telescope and then your target somewhere around here. And then if you connect and you have another point of sight, you can be able to form a plane with that three points, okay? So that's what your plane is looks like. And this is just an imaginary right there. So this line got to be always 90 degree to maintain, okay? That line of sight. So the beams are going to go through, and that two beams got to be um, okay uh, in a plane, and that plane got to be perpendicular okay to this vertex, and this angle got to be always perpendicular, 90 degree. So why do we have to keep this plane and that vertex 90 degree? Is because we want to get that okay double angle. Um, coming out from the pentaprism prism to be always 90. And if this angle is going to be deviated from 90, you won't be getting, okay, you won't be getting uh, the angle coming out from your pentaprism prism at 90 degree at all, okay? So to get 90 degree emerging beam, you, you have your line of sight plane and the vertex at 90 degree. Okay, attached optical squares. Optical squares, you can attach it, okay, to the telescope. So here you can see the opening in the sight, right, of the sphere. So your sphere, so right here, okay, of the optical square attachment projects a line of sight at a right angle to the line of sight of your telescope. So here is your sphere, okay, and uh, on the side of that sphere, you're gonna see the optical square, okay? Right now you can't really see anyway, so you gotta know that it's at the sphere, okay? So what we're trying to do is we are making the right angle, again, okay, to the line of sight. So the right angle beam, that's just a ray, okay? It's a telescope-based setup. A zero offset optical square and that exists through the hole in sight 
okay, in the side of that spear. So now we're going to draw this spear into this diagram so we can be able to see where your counter prism is, okay, to make that 90 degree line. So a telescope base setup is nothing but the one that is producing your right angle beam, and it's a zero offset uh, optical square. Okay, and that beam exists through the hole in the side of your sphere. So here, when you look at it in this picture, the offset optical square has two spheres. Okay, one um, right now, one moment. The um, the schematic shows okay right here. Your diagram is showing the zero offset optical square. So we can see inside, and here is our counter prism. So both the vertical and then the horizontal line of your sight pass through the center of that sphere. So thus there can be rotation about either axis without lateral movement of either axis. Okay. So we have our first reflection, the first mirror right there second reflection, the so second mirror right there, okay, and then come out. So here, the angles are being compensated, the increase plus is right there, minus is right here, they compensate each other, so therefore the beam that come out, okay, by hitting the pendra prison will always be 90 degree, yeah, so right here you can see, right there, so that's perfectly 90 degree with your line of sight. Okay. Pretty easy to see from the side view. So anyway, so that's happening right here in there, yeah. And we're attaching this part right here at that little sphere on the side of it. Okay, that's where your optical square is going to be attached in order to uh, correct this beam. Why do we have to do it? Uh, because our um, telescope design is like that. Okay, you don't want this beam to hit here. You don't want this beam to okay reflect back to you know out to the target. Um, so because the target is right here, so you don't want it bounce all the way back, and you don't want it to hit like zigzag inside of your telescope. Okay, we want a precision beam, and that precision beam is going to be going this way. Yeah. And we want it to go all the way down like that. So optics is nothing but we're playing with the mirror, yeah. And we have many different types of mirror. You have your convex, your concave, your plane mirror. Okay, we have different kinds of concave and convex, and they can all do reflection. Okay, and we're playing with that. Why? Because light is like a line, yeah. You can form a line, you can intensify the light. So therefore, we're using the mirror to do all of that. So giving out a path for the, for the light. So if you let the light go, it will go anywhere it can go. Yeah? But you can trap it in a system and then let it go in the way we want the light to go to intensify it. Okay? And also form the clear path. So that's what we're trying to do in this mm -hmm. instrument. So we can use it to measure things. Okay, now we have a double sphere, another optical square, and we also call this instrument offset optical square. Okay, and we can it can be used in either manner. So it may be used as a zero offset optical square or extended so that the right angle line of sight avoids the obstruction. Again, we don't want any kind of obstruction. So here, when you take a look at it here, I have, instead of one sphere, I have two. So the offset set optical square has two spheres now. So they're about four inches apart. Okay, also it depends on the manufacturers. As some people make it uh, smaller and some, some of them are bigger spheres. So it may be used as a zero offset optical square or extend it. But the final goal, again, Okay, the final goal of doing these spheres is to make sure that the right angle line of sight avoids the obstruction. So 
it should build that way, reflect first reflection, second reflection, and then going down, and we're gonna keep the right angle right here, okay? So your right angle is right here, 90 degree perfect. Okay, so the tooling bar, so the tooling bar is just a rack, okay, that's developed for optical metrology where optical instruments are placed along it. So it's just giving you a support anyway. So if you have a bar, you can use it as a support. So what are you supporting? You're supporting the optical square and then your datum target, okay? So the more you don't touch, the more they are uh, stabilized, the better it is, your measurement is. So in this example, you can see the parallel plates, okay, are aligned by optical means. And a tooling bar is used to simplify the support of that instrument. So here's your telescope and here's your datum target right there, okay. So if you cut it out and exaggerate it, you're going to see all of this. So that's coming from this little part right there. So if that were not available, if this support is not available, an intermediate target, okay, uh, in the previous pixels, early pixels, you can see the intermediate somewhere around in this line could be used to establish that datum. So what we're trying to do is this datum line of sight, okay? I want it to be as uh, straight as possible. So if you don't have an intermediate, okay, target, you're going to use a tool tooling bar right there as a support. Okay, so the sweep optical square is just a useful version of the attached optical square. And you have alignment telescope, and then you have optical square, okay? And they're in a three-footed vertical stand. And it's widely used, and what we do is we check the flatness. So when you take a look at it here in this sweep optical square, and we usually, okay, it's, they're useful in multiple measurements from one horizontal plane. So you have your horizontal plane right there where, okay, all of this um, three feet are going to be on that horizontal plane. So when you take a look at it here, you have pat F, and that's a totally non-adjustable. And we have pat G, and then we have pat H, okay? They are adjustable. And... Uh, how do we know that? Because there's no knob here. And here you can see the knob B, and then you have your knob A here, okay? And you can adjust pad G and pad H. And the knob J here is a little one right there, okay? That's just providing the uh, fine rotation, okay? Rotation of movement. And this knob J is not to move pad F, okay? That's just for fine adjustment. And then we have our D, which is this one right here. That's just a lock, okay, against your rotation. And then we have our K. Okay, K is right here, down there. That's just a locking screw, okay, for your optical uh, micrometers right here and there. So this sweep optical square, it requires three datum targets. Why do we need three datum targets? Because we have to establish a reference plane, okay? Because the measurements are going from this reference plane. So therefore, we need three datum targets. So this sweep optical square target has a series of parallel lines. And these lines are inclined it to this cross line. The widths vary, so that the most convenient way, you will have to select it, okay? So the widest, okay, for the most distance. So that's how we select the width. And the setting is made to equalize the lengths of the cross line or the areas. Okay, so now you can see this. So when you take a look at it here, 
this is your cross line, okay? And this is your alert, okay? Your left, your up, and then down, and then your right, okay? So you can see uh, so much right here, so we'll go to the next uh, diagram. So the datum targets are set up in line, all right, with the feet, again, okay, of the instrument. So like here. So when you take a look at this pitch off, okay, you're gonna see your the sweep optical square right here rests on the surface. Okay, and we are testing that surface because we're checking the flatness of that. Okay. So targets resting on the surface are used to establish again the reference. So here when you take a look at it here, you have your reference plane set up through the targets. Okay, so that's your reference plane. Your targets are on this surface. And this surface is under test. So when you take a look at this big pitch hole right here, so you can see the bars on the targets lie okay across the cross line. Uh, lie along the cross line. So here I have target number one, okay, right here. So that's your datum, a second datum is going to be here, okay, second target. And then my third target is right here, okay, and I have number four target right there for checking. So we call it sweep because you're sweeping, okay, so the direction of sweep is going to go from here all the way, blah, 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 to here. So here is my X, my Y, okay. And this is the bottom of your three feet right there, okay, from your sweep uh, optical square feet. Now we can see that on the surface. So it's kind of like your view. So you're viewing from the bottom like that, okay, and then flip it so you can see this plane underneath of your um, optical square right here. So we're going to use the three datum targets in conjunction with the sweep optical square to check the flatness of that surface. So after they are set to establish the reference plane like this, okay, we're going to add that full target. And we will use it for vertical measurements, okay, any place in that plane. So first, for the horizontal measurement for the surface flatness, you're going to need three data, okay? First, before we put the data references, we have to set up the reference plane right there, okay? We put one, two, three, so that's a one, two, three, right there and set up that plane, okay? And this is just showing you the sweep direction, sweep direction right there going from one, target one, target two, and then target three. Once you have done that, you can get into the horizontal. Uh, after you finish the horizontal, you're going to get into vertical, okay? So your vertical measurement, you're going to add the full data, okay? Anyway, so that's how we measure the flatness. Okay, so application. For application, we can see three data datum targets are used. Uh, again, along with your sweep optical square. So after they are set to establish the reference plane, we're going to put the full target, okay, and get your vertical measurement. And then the technique for application, we're going to use it, okay. Um, so the row of your sweep optical square, we're going to use it in a workpiece, okay, uh, especially in a large marine engine bed plate. So this is a diagram for your marine engine bed plate okay so that's where you put here if you look at look at it carefully you're going to see the data number one number two right there and then number three right here okay and again we're looking at the plane uh, from the bottom so see this is your instrument okay foot number one, two, and three right there, okay? And those are your adjustable foot, okay? And we have only one fixed 
foot, okay, the one that doesn't have any kind of adjustment. So now you can be able to see all this. See that line, okay, your data point one, two. So your sweep direction is going from here, go all the way to two, and then all the way to three, okay. So it just enables all critical elevations to be measured from one position. So we want all of that to be on that plane. So therefore, you're going to measure the flatness by hitting the datum point, okay, all around. So sweeping from here, go there, and then there. So by sweeping it, you can be able to measure the flatness, okay, along that line, along this line, along this line, along that line, along that line, and then along this line, okay. So for large marine engine plate, okay, engine bed plate, we want it to be as flat as possible. And you have to make sure that they are flat, okay? Therefore, you put your instrument right here to sweep it, okay? It's kind of like monitoring, checking. All right, the next one is your scan prism. So the scan prism is one that can establish or scan the plane surfaces without disturbing again the line of sight of alignment telescope okay we want the line of sight to be as straight as possible okay so the reference planes can be changed by rotating the telescope on its own axis so here the advantage is we can change the reference plane with this instrument so when you take a look at the here reference plane can be selected okay by rotating the telescope so for scan prism we can rotate our telescope so that's a advantage so we're going to rotate blah 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 okay and we're going to choose the reference plane so in this example the vertical plane okay so we're establishing in the vertical plane like this okay so like that and then if you go from this side, you want to get another vertical plane like this, okay? And then you can also get another vertical plane like that. So anyway, you turn it around 360 degree by rotating the telescope, okay? So again, scan prism is good. Why? Because you can scan the plane surfaces, yeah? And we're not disturbing our important line of sight for alignment at all. Why? We can rotate the telescope. Okay. So again, scan prism, you can rotate the telescope. So therefore, you can be able to scan the plane surfaces. That's all you have to know. Okay, so the detached optical squares, it does an optical square. Okay, but then you have an adjustable table. So it requires a series of adjustments, and what we're trying to do is to ensure the alignment. Because alignment is pretty important in optical instruments because you have to direct your light. Okay, so we can use the light to measure. So here you can see the optical square in your adjustable table. So the adjustments allow it to be aligned, okay, with both your datum line of sight and then your workpiece. So one alignment is most critical. Why? Because the vertex, remember the vertex and the prism? So the vertex of that prism got to be perpendicular to the plane of your data line of sight. And it also got to be the right angle, okay, with the line of sight. So fortunately, so these adjustments can be expedited, okay, optically, we can do it. So a mirror is placed right here, okay, with this reflecting surface. And we're gonna put that surface down on the three locating pin so here one two three and here with this little circle you can be able to see the mirror where it's going to be placed on top of this housing then we're going to use auto reflection okay to align the uh, optical square so that's uh, the uh, feature of your detached optical square it's like a little camera box you know Okay, so the site level plumpness is nothing but we have our horizontal and then the vertical plane references, okay, and we establish these planes or, or references by using gravity. 
So they are referenced with a something called a plant lung, and that's why we call it plant nest or a level. And that's why we call it site level. It's just leveling, okay? It's trying to get the correct alignment. The striding level is the first one. So the striding level is usually strapped to the barrel, okay, of your telescope, of course, or your collimator. So it allows the line of sight to be set to the horizontal plane. So the striding level is doing nothing but we are okay, uh, getting this line of sight set to the horizontal plane. So we're going to take a look at this picture. It's a little bit complicated, so you've got to go slow when you're looking at the complicated picture. So the striding level is strapped to the barrel. So when you look at this here, uh, you're going to see in this picture, we're going to mount, okay, with the holding strap right there on the micro alignment telescope, okay, with the uh, spear rig adapter. So that's where we're going to put it. Okay, we can be able to uh, get this line of sight, okay, to the horizontal plane. And here, when you look at it here, so that's your plate bubble for leveling, okay, for rough leveling. And when you look at it here, that's your precision bubble, again, for bubbling and leveling right here. So you check this little bubbling going up and down, up and down. So it's got to be completely stabilized, okay, when you get the correct alignment. So here, that's your prism reader rotating through 360 degree, and then it can turn sideways. So here, when you look at the bubble bubbling right here, you can see this bubble, so that's not level, and that's your level, and then this is not level, okay? So that's your precision bubble as you review it, okay, from the side. So here, you're going to see the detail view showing the prism reader inside, okay? So cross level is a type of striding level. It mounts on the barrel at 90 degree from the line of sight and then locates from a hole in the barrel. So right here, when you take a look at this, this is just a typical application of your alignment telescope, okay, right here with your striding level, okay? And the requirement is to place the eight mounting, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay, seven, and then eight mounting pads in the same plane. So we can ensure that this plane is level, yeah? So that's called a cross level, the same as your striding level, but then try to make the plane, okay, uh, to, to ensure the plane is completely level. So we use a support, and there are your eight mounting pads. All right, the sight level, also called tilting level or optical tooling level, okay? So it can be supported on almost any surface, on or off a workpiece, and swept through a 360 degree horizontal level plane. So the telescope can be aimed by using base, okay, in any direction around your azimuth axis. So your azimuth axis is nothing but a set perpendicular to your horizontal axis. So like this, okay. Construction, how are we going to construct it? So a site level is the telescope with an integral level mounted on a tilting base, okay? And the instrument is aligned, and you can see the bubble right there, of the level is centered, and the line of sight is completely horizontal, meaning like it's not vertical like this, it's going horizontal like that. Four leveling screw. I'm just showing you though where the screws are. So the side level has four adjusting screws. So that's where okay you're uh, doing your adjustment and you will be using the screws to adjust. So with four, each axis can be adjusted independently. Your X, Y, and Z scale. So getting into the scales, so when you look at the side level scale, okay, you have a bifilar scale. And you can be able to use it at four distances. And the target is the center of the space between pairs of your lines. So in British, we're going to go with 0 0.100 inch between the divisions. And for SR, we're going to use millimeters, you know, going with two millimeters. 
So the example, American, so we use a British scale. So therefore here it's born with your uh, feet, okay? And our typical side level scale, I know that it has a uh, bifilar scales for use, again, uh, to four distances. So the target is the center of the space between pairs of lines, okay? So here it's showing you that's from 50 to 130. This one is from 20 to 50. And this scale right here, the third one is from 7 to 20. And the last one right here, okay, is you can go up to 7 feet. So we can do four distances. The first scale right there, second one right here, the third one right there, and the fourth one right there. A little bit difficult to read. Uh, you have to go slow. <laughs> okay. All right, optical micrometers. So here we have optical micrometers. Yay, this is the last slide. And uh, they are used with the sight level, okay, to divide the space between major scale divisions. So it looks like a big instrument like this. You also have a handheld one. So for British scale, you're going to divide, so you're going to have 100 divisions, and then you're going to go with inch again at three decimal. So that's 0 0.001 1 inch. So for SI micrometer, it's divided into 0 0.02 millimeter divisions. Okay. So some students are pretty, they're so concerned about the divisions that you don't have to, uh, because it's not necessary right now. Okay. All you have to know is you have instrument, you have you who is going to measure and use that instrument. Okay, and uh, you have errors because of the instrument or because of you. Okay, and then you're making a measurement. And when you make a measurement, uh, you will be using a unit, okay, following a standard, and usually SI or British. In America, most of them use the British systems, still using them. Okay, uh, if you go international, you'll be using SI system. So, and then you're going to give your reading, okay, using these uh, units so that other people can be able to understand what you're reading. And you will have different kinds of measurements, okay, because it's not only linearity that you're measuring, you have your flatness, your straightness, your surfaces, you have your contour, okay, so many different kinds of profile you will be uh, measuring. You have inside measurement, you have outside measurement, and they're not easy, okay, so we started from the ruler, okay, and all the way to now the big machines, and we use uh, different kinds of designs for measurement. So right now we're using the light, okay? So we have an uh, instrument, okay? For, for using the light, you can be able to measure very, very long distances and also very, very short distances, okay? And uh, you will be needing a particular system design, okay? Measurement system design, that's your instrument. So uh, that's what we're learning. And if you get it, you're okay. So any kind of this, okay, unit and divisions, don't worry. As soon as you get the, me uh, the measuring instrument, you will get on it, you have a manual, and then you will read it, and you will use it, and you will get it within one week, okay? So don't stress about the units and the division right now. Okay, that's it for chapter 16, part 2.